Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. Before we get to this week's episode, I have a few announcements. First, I will be taking a week off, so no new episode next weekend. We'll be back on July 12th with the prolific and amazing Jennifer Love Giranda. I've also been working on a very exciting project. If you're on the mailing list, you got a little sneak announcement last week. An exhibit curated in collaboration with Maria Coit of Curated for Kids, which is a wonderful blog you should check out. We have been working with artists, many of whom have been interviewed here or featured on Curated for Kids, to create an online exhibit intended for a K-8 through audience. The exhibit includes brief video interviews with artists. Any sales will include 20% donated to Amplifier. The Education Amplifier Program is committed to amplifying the voices of social change movements through art and community engagement by creating meaningful ways for educators and their students to join the conversation. Every month during the 2018-19 to program year, registered amplifier educators received comprehensive teaching tools in their inbox to begin facilitating conversations around climate justice, criminal justice reform, voting rights, immigration rights, disability justice, gun reform, queer rights, and literacy with students. Working with 10 youth leaders and artists, Amplifier developed teaching tools designed for middle and high school classes with the intention to engage youth across the country in discussion around issues impacting them and their communities. The We the Future artwork and the accompanying teaching tools provide both a mirror and a window into various pathways of self-awareness, healing, and action. These conversation drivers are being shared with the hopes that young people in every region of the United States will be inspired to take action in support of justice and equality. You can register for your own free teaching tools to become an Amplifier Educator at amplifier.org slash call for educators. So that's amplifier, A-M-P-L-I-F-I-E-R dot org slash call dash for dash educators. I signed up last year and found the materials they sent really helpful, although I did have to adjust a little bit for elementary age levels. The posters designed by amazing contemporary artists are just incredible. So I'm very excited to support Amplifier through this exhibit. The exhibit will open on July 10th with a special Instagram Live event. We'd love to virtually see you there. We do also plan to continue this collaboration with future exhibits and other projects and would like to offer an open call for art in the future. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, on to this week's episode. It was so much fun talking with Mark Rohde. Our chat brought me down memory lane a bit as my path was similar in many ways to his. Living in New York in our 20s, engaged in the art world there with dreams of becoming an art professor. I loved hearing how Mark's dream shifted and how his art practice is also shifting now to better align with other values in life, like family and stability. It's also been helpful doing these follow-up chats about racism with the artists that I've interviewed. I realized that these questions were shockingly lacking from my initial thoughts about what to discuss. So my attempt to rectify that is going back to those that have already been recorded but not yet released. Mark talked about several Black artists that he likes to share with students, including one I didn't know. I'll link to them in the blog post, so go check that out. Mark Rohde is an artist and educator based in Minneapolis. He paints within the realm of geometric abstraction, exploring the spatial possibilities and contradictions in the picture plane. Mark also teaches visual art to students in grades 1 through 5 at an elementary school in the Twin Cities. 
His students are a continual source of inspiration. So Mark Rohde, I like to start with a little bit of background. Yeah. How did you become an artist and a teacher and kind of which one came first? So I grew up in Minnesota and, Mm -hmm. you know, art always fascinated me. I was really into art at an early age. Went to the University of Minnesota for undergrad Mm -hmm. and majored in art. And then after that, I moved with a bunch of friends to New York City and I was in a band at the time and I was doing the whole nice yeah doing the whole music thing and playing gigs and recording and stuff and lived in this loft in Brooklyn and super fun yeah and I had a studio space there which was fun and so kind of got you know into the art scene there a little bit and it's going to openings and it was just it was just a really Mm -hmm. fun time in my 20s that happened for like several years like about three years until I decided to go to grad school and I applied to Pratt Institute Mm -hmm. in Brooklyn and got in and they have a cool program where you can get your MFA but also stay on for an extra year and get uh, teaching certified. Ah. So they have an art education program there too. So it's kind of, it's cool. And some of it kind of overlaps, like some of your education credits would take care of some of the other credits for the MFA program. So, So it was cool. It was, it was a good compromise. And I, early on, I felt I had this dream of, you know, being a a professor at a college and and doing that whole thing. And I don't know, like the older I got, like I just, that dream kind of faded a little bit. And I just had Mm -hmm. a lot of friends that I knew did go that route and, you know, they're happy and everything, but I just, they they really struggled early on with, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like making a living out of it and, and all that. And so for me, I just, I really loved teaching, but I also wanted some stability too. Yeah. Like financially and, you know, that kind of thing. So, so anyways, I got my MFA and got my teaching certificate, but spent about a year really in the studio and making as much work as I could and keeping up with it. And yeah, but then I, I started substitute teaching in Brooklyn and that was really fun. And I just, I just really fell in love with teaching again. So I ended up getting a job teaching at a middle school in Manhattan and it was, it was just, it was just really fun. And I, I just really loved it a lot. And so the, the whole studio art making kind of fell by the wayside for a little bit. And mm-hmm. so then I was, I was teaching there for a couple years and I got married and we wanted to have kids and we didn't have any family out in New York city. So yeah, it just kept on getting more expensive and more expensive. Yeah. And was like, this is uh. just, this is just like untenable you know like we just were Mm -hmm. I just felt like it was a grind you know like we love New York City we were there for or I was there for like seven years and my wife was there for about 10 and she's from Connecticut but it just got to a point where it was just like it was just really hard financially and for some other reasons too and we wanted to have a kid and we just couldn't see that happening (laughs) yeah (laughs) New York City so so we decided to move back to Minnesota where I'm from and I got a job at an elementary school here in the Twin Cities and my wife got a uh, job. She's a graphic designer. So, oh. so yeah, we've been here ever since. And I've been at the elementary level and I'm, a, I'm at my second school since moving back. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, as far as the art making goes, like when we moved back, I found that I had a little bit more time for a while to like, you know, I, I set up a home studio and kind of gotten, gotten a groove there and met all the, or not all, but like met a lot of the artists that were showing their work in the Twin Cities and became familiar with the art scene here and went to opening. Mm-hmm. And, and all that. And so that was really cool and made a ton of friends. But then, of course, life happens again and our daughter was born. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it, I feel like it kind of just... I go in these, uh, it kind of ebbs and flows, you know, like there's mm-hmm. moments where I'm I'm really in the studio a lot. And then there's moments where I just have to kind of take a step back or take a break or adjust, adjust my, my work, like my studio practice. So yeah, it is what it is. And at first I was like really kind of down about it. Kind of took me a while to mm-hmm. come to terms with that, you know, because like in grad school, I'm sure you know, it's like they just hammer it over over your head like you got to be in their studio uh-huh. all the time like crank and work out and so I still kind of had that mentality and I was just like well, it was just hard to come to terms with that once once May was born and but I'm, I'm okay with that now and you know it's just it is what it is and I know a lot of artist friends who are in the same boat and you know everyone everyone has a different setup or situation and you know yeah 
Totally. Yeah. I feel like our paths might have crossed at some point because I kind of did the same, like was in New York in my 20s and just loving it and being part of the art scene, but also being involved in schools there. Yeah. And so I totally relate. And we did almost the same thing, like met in New York and ended up getting married and wanting to have a kid and being like, ah, how do we do this here? (laughs) Are you from California or? No, I grew up in Montana. Oh, cool. Okay. And my husband lived in New York when he was a kid and then grew up mostly in Miami. Okay, got it. But yeah, we we ended up out here in California kind of through a circuitous path. Sure, yeah. But definitely feel like New York is a hard place to try to have kids. Yeah, it is. I I have such a love-hate relationship with New York. Like, I love so many (laughs) aspects of it. The cultural aspect, like everything about it is just... I, I miss that energy, you know, like when you're walking down the street and just the smells and the food, it's everything. And yeah, you just get like the sense, especially with art and music, you just feel like you're really a part of something big, you know, and mm-hmm. like a momentous occasion could be happening at any moment. <laughs> right. And so I, I definitely miss that. But I also, I just feel like you have to have a lot of money to live there or yeah. living like really far out and your commute sucks or, <laughs> or you have to like have yeah. family there. I don't know. Like, I mean, people make it work and it's awesome, but yeah. So yeah, we're, it's just a place to visit now for us. <laughs> yeah. And having space is, yeah. That's the hard thing. For sure. And thinking of space, how has it been? Like, how was that shift from having a studio outside of your home to making, creating a home studio for yourself? Yeah. You know, it's, it's awesome. I, when we first moved back here, we were just, we were renting an apartment and we kind of had this garden. I don't even know how you, what do what you call it? It's not like a patio. It's like a porch area, but not really. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like this extra room. And it's so funny, like in New York, like space is such a premium, right? Like that little room would have been like for yeah. sure labeled a bedroom or something. <laughs> yes. When we rented here, it, it wasn't even like in the listing. It was just like this extra room, <laughs> you know, like it's just mm-hmm. funny. So I was like, sweet. So I set up a little studio there and it was, it's super small, but, and then I, uh, the house that we're at now, the studio is in the basement and I just love it. Like, I mean, especially, you know, when I, as a, I mean, I'm a full-time teacher and Mm -hmm. to not have to like commute anywhere to a studio or like drive anywhere, like, because when cities you have to drive, you know, like most cities, but I just, you know, after a a long day of teaching or even on the weekends, like to not have to like travel anywhere to a studio. Like, I think there is something nice about having a space that's separate where like you can go somewhere else and you kind of enter a different mental space when you're in a different location. Too, mm-hmm. but I just think for the convenience for my for my life, it's just awesome to to have that because I can just kind of carve out little bits of time here and there and make the yeah. most of it. And that's kind of what I've I've learned how to do this. Is just you know I'm not gonna. It's rare to have several hours of studio time. I mm-hmm. find that I have little bits here and there, maybe like an hour after the kids go to bed or like half an hour in the morning or that kind of thing. And yeah, just trying to really capitalize on those little smaller moments, you know, the, the days when I, I have four or five hours in the studio are gone, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. At least for now. <laughs> At least for now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think for where I'm, where I'm at right now, I think a home studio really is, is nice. And I, I'm an oil painter. Mm-hmm. So it, it definitely did take me a little time to kind of figure out how to do that safely mm-hmm. and kind of figure that out. Yeah. But yeah. I feel like it's pretty good. And what would your tips be about that, about the safety issue with oil painting at home? Yeah. I mean, I think I, so like my studio is in the basement, but I, mm-hmm. I have a lot of windows in this kind of workspace mm-hmm. and just kind of have it vented all the time. And I got like the appropriate, like you can get these metal they're probably in a, at every school these like oily mm-hmm. rag metal oh right uh, trash bins and like that, like that, that kind of thing you know so like if you're throwing stuff yeah. away like you're making sure you don't have this like heaping pile of oily rag <laughs> sitting out ready to combust <laughs> right or, you know like that kind of thing <laughs> I just kind of had to do my yeah. research a little more and kind of just like figure all that out and mm-hmm. just make sure it was kind of up to code and everything. Right. And especially with kids. Yeah. Yeah. Like totally yeah. having like a separate, like I could never do that, obviously. Like I know some people who have like a table out in their living room and do their art. And I just feel like I just I couldn't mm-hmm. do that with kids running around. So just having like a separate, yeah. you know, with the door locked and just having this understanding with mm-hmm. with the kids, or, you know, my four-year-old who likes to snoop, <laughs> snoop around, but 
having that kind of be the rule where that's that's my space and you know <laughs> yeah but yeah it's 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 worked out it's worked out yeah. pretty well and it's kind of fun too to like carve out that space and dial it in mm-hmm. it's like it's like a fun project to like get the right lighting and get the right <laughs> white paint and make it look yeah make it look good and so it was it was fun getting that all set up yeah and then so you switched from middle school to elementary how was that and and do you kind of have a preference that's an interesting question I, I think about that a lot it's funny because when I was in when I was at Pratt and I was like thinking about you know becoming a teacher and stuff I was like definitely I'm gonna do high school it's like high school or bust you know mm-hmm. but of course when you're after you graduate, you kind of just take what you can get, you know? And yeah. so I got that middle school job. And I think, I think there's like pros and cons to like every age group I've realized, you know, like I think Mm -hmm. there's really cool aspects of middle school, uh, teaching at a middle school. Like they're, they're really like more in tune with like popular culture and you can have these conversations with them. They're all about expressing their emotional struggles at the time, you know, like they're, and they're also like searching for identity. So like projects that have to deal with identity and Mm -hmm. changing identities and stuff they really liked that you know and it was really fun to to do that to make projects Mm -hmm. like that that tap into that side but you know the the caveat is you know it's it's middle school and they're very much you know kind of insecure and they're not they're not as open to Mm -hmm. try new things out and they're always concerned about what their friends are doing and stuff like that and so Mm -hmm. I guess that's the caveat and with elementary school it's it's kind of the opposite as far as the motivational piece. It's like elementary school, they're just so engaged and like down to do whatever you, (laughs) whatever you present to them. And it's just, they're unfiltered and like, just, you know, their creativity is, it's, they don't, they don't care what anyone thinks, you know, like they're just, (laughs) <laughs> They're just so courageous and it just yeah. all comes out and, you know, they don't even know what inhibitions are. I mean, it's just so cool to see. So th- to see the kind of that kind of unfiltered creativity come out, I mean, it's just, it's just so cool. And I have, I have friends who, who are like, oh, you, don't you want to teach? Cause I, you know, I've, I've been teaching elementary for, this is my seventh year. Mm-hmm. And I, I yeah. still have friends who are like, don't you, don't you want to like change and like do high school? Like, cause don't the kids like, won't they be doing better art in high school? And I'm like, not necessarily. Uh, I just feel like the older right. people get, like the more self-conscious they get and that affects their art. And, you know, sure, sure. There's some great artists in, in high school and, and middle school and stuff. But yeah, I just, I just love that uninhibited creativity that I see in, in the elementary mm-hmm. school. There are some caveats there too. It's the the cons, I guess, are for me, like kindergarten and first grade, those are those are a little bit more challenging because mm-hmm. they they have a hard time dealing with their emotions or dealing oh. with, you know, like sharing and, and all that kind of stuff. And everything is just really intense. And but it, it can be fun too yeah. if you just if you just kind of roll with it. And but yeah, there's so there's I think there's just pros and cons with each each age group. But I really like elementary elementary school. I yeah. think, you know. It's just it's just really cool. Yeah. And do you feel like at all that parenting has changed that? Like having your own kids has made you either more appreciative of that age group or maybe less? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think like when I first transi- transitioned to elementary school, I felt like, you know, I needed like more patience, especially with the younger kids. And it was mm-hmm. I was like, wow, like, you really need to be patient. I mean, you had to be patient with middle school kids, but it was just a different type of patience. Yeah. <laughs> but with like the younger kids, I was like, oh, wow. But now, yeah, since I've had May and, and our son, and it's, I, I've learned that, I don't know, I, just, I feel like I've had, I have more patience now with, with those younger kids, or I can kind of see where they're coming from, or uh-huh. yeah, there's a little bit more perspective with that, for sure. Yeah. And do you, I know I, because I have a four-year-old as well, and I totally test out lessons with her. Yeah. Like, I'll have her be my little guinea pig. Do you do that at all? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Especially like, <laughs> yeah, so for some of those kindergarten or first grade projects, for sure. Yeah, like testing out the steps and having to do and she really Uh likes like she loves to help out and make stuff what I'm doing Mm -hmm. and especially now that you know we're doing everything remotely with the distance learning stuff she's seen everything I'm doing and so yeah we've been doing doing a lot of stuff together which is really cool yeah it's really fun to be able to involve your kids in that I don't know about you but I feel like this year it's it's been really with May it's been especially fun like because I feel like she's just starting to like really be able to use scissors and use some of the, the tools mm-hmm. the right way. And it's been really fun to see see her skills develop, you know, and fine motor skills and whatnot. And it's it's cool. It's it's really 
fun. Yeah, it is fun to see that and to see them really want to do things independently. Yeah. You know, my daughter will be like, I can cut that. You don't have to cut anything. I'll do all of it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's it's so fun. So fun. Yeah. And with your teaching, especially now at the elementary level, do you feel like your sort of art making and teaching inform each other at all? Because there, I mean, oil painting is very different from what I'm sure what you're doing with your students. Yeah. But are there ways that they kind of overlap or inform each other? You know, they definitely do. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm mm-hmm. an abstract painter mm-hmm. and... I, you know, (laughs) I'm trying to think of like when it happened, but yeah, early on when I started teaching elementary and started teaching kindergartners and first graders, basic shapes and and lines, I started incorporating those, those formal elements, those, those shapes and lines into my Mm -hmm. work. Cause I really loved the way, like when we're learning about lines, you know, how kids just jump right in and they're doing loopy lines, wavy lines, zigzags. I just love yeah. that direct expression. And so I started incorporating those types of lines. And when we were learning shapes, those types of shapes into my work. And mm-hmm. I would then arrange them in different ways. And because my, my work deals with spatial issues. And mm-hmm. but using those lines and shapes, a lot of times from being directly inspired by, by the kids. Yeah, so it, it definitely has influenced me. And I would when the kids were working, I'd be kind of sketching a little bit while I'm walking around the classroom and stuff and getting ideas. And yeah, just, it's cool. It's, and I'd show the kids my work and they would get super excited. Oh, that's a, you know, a loopy line or a wavy line. So it's just oh. yeah, it definitely I never thought it would influence, to be honest, but it it definitely did. And it was like this constant source of inspiration, which is really great. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I can see that. It's funny because I didn't initially, looking at your work, I didn't initially think about those sort of formal elements that I also am talking about all the time with kids. Yeah. But I totally see that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how you've kind of pushed it that when you first look at it, it doesn't look like work inspired by kids drawing a bunch of lines and shapes. Right. It is very spatial and interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I use a lot of tape and mm-hmm. you know, it's a lot of hard it's like influenced by hard edge painting yeah geometric abstraction and but yeah it's I, I like taking these really freely drawn kind of spontaneously drawn lines and then making those more how do you say like kind of hard edge and yeah. planned out so there's this kind of relationship there with something that's spontaneous but then I take it and make it much more intentional and planned out and you know using tape and marking off areas and stuff so Mm -hmm. trying to create some tension with the lines and how how they interact with the shapes and everything. So yeah. And even how the lines interact with each other or with the different parts of themselves as they kind of, because you have this, the way they're turning is very geometric. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at, yeah, what a kid would say is like, that's a curvy line or a loopy line, but it's a bunch of hard angles creating that loop. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Interesting. And thinking about your colors, how do you decide on colors and color palettes? Yeah, it's a good question. I... It's hard for me to answer that question. Yeah. I guess it's just something that has developed over time. And I've just learned certain different color relationships work well Mm -hmm. with what I'm doing. But I I definitely try and and push myself to use different color combinations. I'm always just looking at other artists and thinking about how they use color and Mm -hmm. figuring out like kind of like what works. I I like using really bold, saturated color and then Mm -hmm. kind of offsetting that with grays and almost like brown and ochres and trying to get those to vibrate against each other you know mm-hmm. and so yeah definitely color relationships it's it's a huge part of my practice and I, I feel like I'm constantly tossing out paintings if like the colors don't work <laughs> well uh, yeah so it, it's a constant struggle uh-huh. but it's it's what keeps me interested and that's the fun of it too you know it's just yeah the excitement of figuring that out it's it's a constant puzzle it's a game you know it is yeah and do you have any kind of favorite color combinations that you keep coming back to? You know, I like, I guess I use a lot of magentas and these kind of, mm-hmm. these cobalt blue a lot. Yeah. Put that over some of these like burnt siennas and ochres mm-hmm. and using these turquoise and yellows and, but yeah, trying to create these contrasts. I try to also yeah. think about, especially with space, transparency and opacity mm-hmm. and having these more flat shapes and flat area 
areas, Mm -hmm. but then also having that touching or going over an area that alludes to depth or a a more spatially rich area. And I I try to do that using different kind of glazing techniques and layering and trying to create more of this transparent look to it. Yeah. So having that relationship going on too, I've been really, really interested in that. So yeah, because I I like creating these spaces where it's like, there's this really formal, strict formal idea going back to abstract expressionism where it's all about respecting the picture plane and Mm -hmm. and having it be these two-dimensional surface and respecting that. So I, I like that idea, but then also like kind of turning that upside down a little bit and showing some illusion and, and depth and trying to question, you know, what what's happening in the in the uh, picture plane and yeah. what's in front, what's behind, what's what is the space I'm looking at, you know? Yeah, I think you totally achieve that. And I, even like the more I look at the paintings, I notice the shadows that are in there that also just add to that depth and sort of questioning where is everything? What's yeah? What's What's on top? What's happening? Sure. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, I, I haven't, you know, this, the work that's on the website's definitely a few years old, but yeah, I just haven't had time lately. With yeah. The new, <laughs> the new addition to our family, but yeah, definitely excited to, yeah. to get back into it. And like you said, I, at the moment it's, it's tough, but hopefully in, in the near future, I'll, I can get back into it or maybe this summer and start plugging away. I'd like to, yeah. and I don't, you know, maybe you have uh, <laughs> some advice on this. But <laughs> one thing I, I've started doing is having like kind of change. So these are, you know, oil on panel paintings. And yeah, some of them are, they're not, they're modestly scaled. They're not huge or anything. But mm-hmm. part of me is like, oh, maybe I should just get, maybe I should just work on paper for a while or, or do, you know, work with yeah. just drawing or watercolor mm-hmm. even, or, you know, just like do something that's a lot more like with oil paints, you know, the whole cleanup, like everything, it's just a lot more involved. Yeah. So I'm just thinking like, Something that's a little bit easier to, if I have a half an hour, just open up a sketch pad or just work on paper and, and do it that way. But. Right. Yeah. I feel like so many artist parents really shift their practice when becoming parents. Yeah. And it's hard to keep oil painting just because of that prep and setup and, you know, not being able to necessarily do it with your kids underfoot. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So I know some people do continue and that's awesome. Like if you can, and that's what you love to do, Mm -hmm. I would say continue. But I do think that idea, like the sort of ideas you're having of maybe I should shift to drawing or watercolor, work on paper, just smaller scale, whatever. Yeah. I think those are instincts that make sense for your situation. Yeah, definitely. I know I completely shifted my practice. I mean, I took quite a break. I didn't really make anything for three years when I had my daughter. And Mm -hmm. I mean, before that, I had been sort of starting to get into installation and really large scale things with lots of detailed paper cutting and (laughs) just like very conceptual. So just lots of time sitting around thinking about what I was going to do. Yeah. And I feel like all of that is is sort of impossible (laughs) right now at this stage. Yeah, but it's cool. I, I was looking at your work and it's very much influenced by your kid like your kid is is very much a presence and it seems like yeah motherhood is a huge theme and stuff so yeah that's great how that your artwork shifted in that way too and it looks like you're using polymer clays and and stuff it's great yeah. yeah. And some Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So definitely... Yeah. Just what can I do with yeah. her? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I do a lot of my studio time is after she's asleep. So it's not like I'm always making art right there with her. Yeah. But I like the idea that the materials I use, I don't really have to put away. I can do it with her if I want to. Yeah. Now the biggest issue is I have to kind of like hoard my Play-Doh collection <laughs> Because yeah, I have I like colors that I that I've mixed that are special to me. Sure, I'm sure. like, no, this is mommy's Play-Doh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But that's probably really inspiring for your kid too, to see her mom working in, in the same material that she's, you know, using. And that's all, that's really cool. Yeah, she's so, I feel like it's very brave the way she mixes colors. And even with paint too, she'll put two colors together that she knows is going to create brown. Yeah. And she's like, it's okay. I want to see what this brown is. Oh yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, one of the, one of the lessons that I did for distance learning was for first grade, I had them do 
do this color wheel with like the tertiary colors and everything, but they had to use Play-Doh. And mm, yeah. and, I, and I knew that like a lot of kids probably might not have Play-Doh at home, but I like, there's all these like recipes online too, where you can like make your own Play-Doh and stuff, yeah. which is cool. But it was just awesome seeing what the kids made. And there's something I think so cool about mixing colors with something so tactile, you know, it's like a material that you use to make something three-dimensional. And I just think that's so awesome. Like it just, yeah. I never thought about it until this year of doing that. And it just, the kids really liked it. And it was, it was just really cool to see. And it was fun for me to, <laughs> to make it and like make a video of it. Ah, uh, yeah. I should do that. I might have to steal that lesson. <laughs> yeah, steal it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I feel like also that like the mushing the clay, mm -hmm. for me, it's very therapeutic. Oh, yeah. And that's something we need right now. Yes, definitely. Yeah. There's kind of like a repetitive nature to it. And you're like mm -hmm. pushing, yeah, squeezing and mashing and it's like so just <laughs> yeah. soft enough, to, you know, and it's right. It's, it's a fun process for sure. Yeah. Do you have any other kind of favorite lessons that you would want to share or talk about? As far as like distance learning goes or just in general? Or... I guess in general or yeah, if you've come up with some great ones for distance learning, I'm sure people would want to hear. Yeah. The, the distance learning thing has been, been challenging. I mean, it's fun because yeah, I don't know, you know, obviously the situation sucks <laughs> and is not ideal. Like I totally miss the kids and the interaction that I have with them and, and all that. Yeah. It's, it's so limiting on what you can do, mm -hmm. you know, over the internet and stuff. But it's kind of also cool to see what the kids are doing, like how they're adapting at home and just using the materials they have. And like, rather yeah. than saying, oh, I can't do this, Mr. Rody, I don't have materials. It's like they're figuring out how to do it, you know, and using what they got. And so I, I yeah. try to really emphasize that at first. I was like, if you don't have paper at home, use like a cut up a paper bag or, you know, like use like uh, some old right. wrapping paper. So I don't know. Just And it's just kind of cool to see yeah. what the kids are turning in and how resourceful mm -hmm. they're being. Like, I, you know, I, when you have these limitations, I think that breeds creativity a lot of times. Yeah. What sort of resources have been helpful with distance learning? Are you using Google Classroom or are you on a different system? Yeah, we're using Google Classroom, yeah. which is cool, you know, and we're basically I'm uploading a, a project for each grade level every Monday. So, mm -hmm. so that's been kind of how that goes. And I'll just take a video of myself making making the project and just kind of explain that. And, and I'll upload it on Monday yeah. and they'll have a week to do it. And, they'll up, you know, they'll take a picture of their work. And then like throughout the week, we'll have yeah. like hangout calls and whoever mm -hmm. can make it can make it, you know, but. And how have you been managing that? Do you teach K through fifth? Yeah. So like the whole elementary? I actually, there's another art teacher in the same school that I'm at and she actually takes care mm -hmm. of all the kids kindergarten. So I okay. taught kindergarten at, at my old school, but this school, I, I don't teach kindergarten. And it's kind of okay. nice because I it's like I don't have to plan for an entire grade level project. So it's yeah, as far as like a prep aspect, it's it's pretty nice. But I mean, I do miss kindergarten. It's kind of fun because they're it is. learning these things for the first time and learning how to use scissors mm -hmm. and mixing colors and holding brushes. Like, it's just fun. But yeah, uh, yeah like trying to do these Google Hangouts and stuff. And so I teach first through fifth grade and with the younger kids it's definitely their parents are in the background or helping them out or but yeah we, I try to have these activities for them to do especially for the younger kids like we'll play a game or mm -hmm. do kind of like a guided drawing kind of thing something yeah. that we wouldn't really do in the classroom but I just think given the circumstances just having them you know do kind of something that's easy to follow <laughs> on a Google Hangout is it's good for them so yeah and do you how many students do you have do you see it each week it's a really big school school there's like 1300 kids uh -huh. at our school wow so but there's uh. another art teacher and so I think I teach around 800 kids and that is we're on a five-day cycle so once every five like basically once a week they have art for an hour yeah so, it's a lot yeah it's uh it's nice this the district that I'm in right now it's it's cool it, they're very supportive of the arts and good budget and, and all that That's so great. yeah I feel very very fortunate very lucky and it's it's mm -hmm. a nice nice situation so yeah that stuff makes a huge yeah. difference yeah yeah and with maybe this is sort of selfish questioning yeah. but with your google hangouts how are you managing that number of kids do you have limits on how many can join 
line or is it really just sort of optional and you, you know, see how many are, are coming in? And is it set up as like, this is first grade, so like each grade has a separate hangout time? Yeah. So we only do one, like for this week, I, I only have two Google Hangouts. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely like a, an optional thing. And I'll just post on Google Classroom, yeah. you know, like second grade Google Hangout is, is this Thursday at two o'clock. Uh-huh. But yeah, it's definitely optional. Like, I mean, I don't say that, but yeah. not all the kids right. end up signing up. So I, I don't limit it at all. And I just, mm-hmm. you know, I, I give them, I made a, a slideshow of the rules of just like, you have to have your microphone muted and raise your hand if you mm-hmm. want to share something, that kind of thing. So they've been actually really, yeah. really good about that. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really fun. Awesome. Because at, at first I was like, oh man, this is going to be chaos. Like everyone's going to have their microphone on. There's going to be like uh. TV going on in the background or, or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But they really, they caught on pretty quick and yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's just been fun to connect with them and catch up with them and just see what they're up to. Yeah. Like we we don't even talk, sometimes we don't even talk about art. I just want to, I'll just say like, oh, what? Because it's been getting really nice out lately in Minnesota and I'll be Mm. like, oh, have you been getting outside or riding your bike or, you know, like that. It's just fun to try to like maintain Mm. those relationships and, and they just want to share and and all that. So I, you know, we, I keep it pretty, pretty open-ended. And, and then for the lessons, you know, it's very much here's the lesson and it's up to them to kind of get that on Google Classroom and, and watch the video and, and do the project and upload that. And I comment on everyone's work and, and all that. So nice. it is what it is. And it's it's good to see you know, when they, when they upload their projects and stuff, but yeah, it, it has been fun to do the, the Google Hangouts too. Yeah. It'd be nice to have that interaction, that connection. Yeah. And I know like there's a lot of kids that are participating in this distance learning, but there's a lot of kids that just haven't been. And it's not surprising, mm-hmm. you know, it's like when can't imagine if parents are having to work or cause a lot yeah. of the stuff, like they need, they need a parent to help out, especially the younger kids Yeah, to access this stuff and get the materials and, and all that. So Right. So it's it's definitely it's definitely a bummer. Like the kids that are are missing out on it, and but uh, just crossing my fingers for next fall that there's some kind of yeah I don't know <laughs> yeah semblance of normalcy. I don't know. Like yeah, we'll see. Right. Yeah, it's looking like more distance learning here. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They've been have they been we'll talking see about that a little bit. I mean, nothing's yeah. nothing's certain yet. Right. But it's definitely sounding like we're starting to kind of prepare for that. So yeah. 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 Are you kind of in that same boat? Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. there hasn't been like the official message, you know, but it's like right. the messaging has been, we're expecting to be back in the fall, but definitely plan on distance learning too. <laughs> so it's kind of, <laughs> right. you know, it's like being oh. prepared for that, but also mm-hmm. being also open to the possibility of returning. And, but that would look different too. I don't know. Right. They're talking about all sorts of things. It's hard to, it's hard to know, but yeah, I guess it's better to plan for every scenario. And cause you know, it's probably like this in California where it's like, it just happened so quickly, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. we were definitely behind, we were behind, you know, our wave of cases came behind the East coast and mm-hmm. the West coast for sure. It was delayed a little bit, but yeah, it was just like that week leading up to spring break in March, things just happened so quickly. And our district was just scrambling to figure out how to do this. And yeah, so I, you know, at, at the very least, I think if we are going to be doing distance learning in the fall, at least we'll have some, we'll all have some experience doing it. <laughs> and yeah, structures in place and, and all that. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Better to be prepared for it. Yeah. Yeah, we one of my because I'm at two schools, one of the principals showed in our staff meeting the other day, a little video guys building a plane while it was in the air. And she was like, this is what you guys are doing. Oh, wow. You are building a plane while it's flying through the air. And it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty incredible when you think about how much we had to pivot, you know, and yeah, in such a short amount of time. Yeah, everyone's everyone's getting much better at technology, which is a good you know? thing, it's, right? Yeah. Well, and I think like, and speaking of good things, I think there will be some mm-hmm. good things that happen. I think, you know, I, I feel like I've been getting a lot of positive messages from parents and stuff. And mm-hmm. I think that's really cool. They're really seeing firsthand what goes into yeah. teaching. And, you know, like with art, as with other sub 
subjects. They're seeing what really goes into these art projects and what mm-hmm. the concepts are. And because oftentimes the parent is doing the project right. right along with the kid. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going yeah. on in, here, in these projects, you know, like they're learning a lot. So I think that's, that's pretty cool to see. And because I, I've always been a big advocate of, you know, I think like as art teachers, we really have to be mm-hmm. constantly promoting our programs with the parents. You know, oftentimes the parents aren't entirely knowledgeable about yeah. all things art and that's okay. But I think part of our responsibility as art teachers is we have to really communicate to the parents and the mm-hmm. families what we're teaching and what we're doing, mm-hmm. why it's important. So I think this whole distance learning situation, I think that's becoming a little more apparent, you know, like they're, they're seeing, it's, everything's a little more transparent yeah. in a way, like they're seeing, you know, what's going on as far as the curriculum and the concepts and, and all that. Yeah, so. that's so true. And I hadn't even really thought about it that way, but I've also gotten some great responses from parents parents and it's cool to see them doing the projects alongside their children and being excited about it. Yeah, that's the best. Yeah, and seeing all that goes into it. Yeah. Now they see every lesson. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, and it's cool because, you know, before this whole COVID thing, we would teach these lessons and they would bring them home and you're, you're just kind of crossing your fingers and hoping right. the artwork gets home okay and that they explain it to their families about what we did and I try to send mm-hmm. out newsletters and I've like an Instagram account for the art projects I do. And so I try to get parents involved in that. But, you know, a lot of times the kids, even though they know what we did and they, they can remember, they probably are going home and the parents might be asking, oh, what is this? Or what do you do? And they might not say it or they'll be like, I don't know. I don't remember. Even though they, I think they yeah. do. But it's just cool to see, yeah, these like parent comments and they're using like the vocabulary or the yeah. concept that they're yeah. talking about it. And it's like, oh, cool. Like, it's like we're teaching not only the kids, but yeah. the adults too. And it's, it's fun. That's really cool. Yeah. We talked a little bit about your work, but I wanted to kind of come back to your work and and talk about yeah. where you, even when you're kind of taking a break, do you continue seeking out opportunities and how do you do that? Where do you look for places to show or sell your work? So I think Minnesota or the Twin Cities has a really, really solid mm-hmm. art scene given its size. You know, obviously it's not like New York or LA or Chicago or anything, but it's got like a really cool tight knit Mm -hmm. scene and a welcoming scene. Like it's very, I don't even know how to say it. Like it's not Mm -hmm. pretentious at all. Like it's very welcoming. And I've made a lot of really good friends here in the art community. And I think the only caveat is there aren't that many places Mm -hmm. to show or like commercial galleries, Yeah, you know, and like some of the commercial, like the commercial galleries that we do have oftentimes they're, they're selling work that is kind of, I don't know, not the most exciting. Yeah, <laughs> I'll say that. It's like meant to kind of sell. It's kind of more generic, right. you know. So there's like, there's a few of those. There's definitely a couple galleries that are, are definitely showing, you know, challenging good work. Mm-hmm. But we do have a lot of galleries that are artist run or co op spaces yeah. that are really cool. And we have a lot of like city art centers. So mm-hmm. the suburbs has this awful connotation. The suburbs, and <laughs> you wouldn't think like like good art centers <laughs> would exist out in these suburbs, but there's some really good spaces and they get tons of donations for their funding and just it's just awesome yeah. there's some really good ones out here and there's just tons of like open calls for art and so I've, I've shown a lot at these art centers and these kind of co-op nice. spaces in the city there's this really exciting space called tuck under mm. gallery and it's a tuck under garage like it's a garage underneath this guy's house uh, and it sounds awesome. ridiculous but it's like he totally outfitted his garage into a gallery space and it's completely professional it's got gallery white walls it's got gallery lights it's Uh it's really nice and for the openings he just does it in the summer but he'll have these openings where you know the garage is is just open and people are just out there like drinking beers and chatting and and like he shows really great art locally yeah so there's like a lot of spaces like that where it's artist run or co-op spaces and, and that kind of thing so yeah that's awesome i think we have like a huge plethora of artists like the art community is huge but not like a 
ton of spaces, but the spaces that we do have are, are really welcoming. And mm-hmm. so I think the, the challenge is there aren't that many like collectors here. Yeah. If you're going to sell your work, you're not going to have like an art collector, like someone, unless you're, unless you're really doing well. Mm-hmm. But I feel like all the art collectors that are collecting are, are buying or go, are going to Chicago or going to LA or New York and, and buy their art there uh-huh. if they live here. Uh-huh. But yeah, you know, I definitely sell my work at some of these art centers, but it's definitely yeah. hard. it would be hard to make a living or, you know, to make, you know, sell a lot of work right. and get money that way. Yeah. And then thinking of, you know, n- like not having the collector base right there, do you feel like something like Saatchi or any other online option for selling is sort of helps with that? Or is it, you know, yeah. does that balance it? Or Right. I've never actually, yeah, yeah. I've never, I haven't had any luck with, with Saatchi or anything, you mm-hmm. know. And to be honest, I, I'm like, okay with not selling. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, and yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very much more into like I, when I sell a painting, it's awesome. Like I love it, and that's great. Yeah. But I love. I also love like trading with other artists and mm-hmm. local artists, or you know, buying one of their works and or selling a work to another artist friend or, or that kind of thing. You know, like I think that's really fun. Yeah. And having that be like almost like a. There's this great book called The Gift, and it's all about these bartering societies, and Ooh. yeah, it's it's very much like this anthropological book, but he talks a lot about how it relates to art making too and Mm -hmm. how it's really important to like not hoard your art (laughs) but also not be so consumed with selling it or like trying to think about the monetary value of it so I I just thought it was like really interesting and yeah definitely a a book I recommend the author is Lewis Hyde okay it's so fulfilling when when you're like trading art yeah that kind of thing with another artist that you like and that's just really exciting so yeah but yeah it's hard to pinpoint exactly you know the whole selling thing At, at first I was very consumed by that but it's just like kind of a different scene here in, in Minnesota and yeah and I'm fine with it and when I sell a painting that's great but I definitely don't put a lot of energy into into trying to, to sell my work at this point yeah maybe I should spend more time doing that but I don't know <laughs> oh, well I feel like for a lot of us that are teachers and you're kind of you're teaching full-time like that's where your income comes right. from so then you're not you don't have to be so worried about selling yeah. but it's also everything around selling at least for me is so confusing and stressful yeah. and how do I price it and how do I market what does that even mean right. yeah. <laughs> I have no idea how to do any of yeah. that yeah totally yeah and it's stuff that isn't really taught in art school at least it wasn't for me yeah there was this uh the last year I was at Pratt they had this class that they started it was all about the business side of it you know and uh, yeah there was this great book that came out at that time called art slash work I don't know if you've ever seen that no i'm writing it down (laughs) it's like bright red it was really cool it's like this handbook on all things Mm. related to the business side of it you know and how do you run a a studio practice you know and how do you price your work right how do you navigate galleries and all that and so that came out and then it's like the author and here it is artwork and then so it's heather darcy bandari and then jonathan melber so yeah jonathan melber he was the one that kind of like ran the class but Mm -hmm. definitely check it out it looks like they have an updated revised version awesome i definitely recommend recommend that to any artist who even even if you're a successful artist and you're showing at galleries and it's just like a nice book to refer to here and there yeah so oh, that's great yeah and it, it talks about all these things that you're almost like afraid to ask someone like all the like the little small right. little questions where you're like you feel like you can know it but <laughs> you're like hesitant to ask someone or admit that you don't know the answer to that right but really no one you know it's okay and like everyone i don't know it's all in this book basically and it's just cool to have that uh, that reference so that's great yeah but yeah i hear you that's nice to have it written down by artists yeah <laughs> yeah but cool. definitely like that side of it was definitely lacking and mm-hmm. it was mostly about the work and, and studio practice yeah. and some art history and stuff and theory but that whole business side of it is huge especially when you're like right out of school you know and you're trying to, mm-hmm. to really make it and yeah when, when selling is a big thing like in new york and before i had a teaching mm-hmm. gig you know i had the rent of our apartment to deal with i had the rent of our uh, studio to deal with i was just like i did not know how people could do it and and just kind of and then at the same time trying to make inroads in the in the art scene there and stuff and it's it's hard yeah but yeah so i, I definitely like the art scene here a lot love the people mm-hmm. i think something that we're lacking in a way is that 
as much as I say like, oh, like, you know, I don't care about selling. I, I do think that the, the collector base is, is a super important component to a healthy art scene. Mm-hmm. So that aspect is somewhat detrimental, I think, in the Twin Cities. And then also, I feel like we're lacking a, a solid form of criticism. Like we, we don't have mm-hmm. that many sources of art criticism here. Ah, uh, yeah. That are, you know, like there's like the papers and stuff, but it's not at the level that it should be or where you see it in larger cities. So that's kind of a bummer. But I also think that's a, a really important aspect to a healthy art scene, yeah. you know. And those are the criticism and the collectors are connected. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What's it like in LA, like the art scene there? And I can imagine it's pretty similar to New York. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm a little disconnected because, you know, when we moved here, I had a, at the time I had a two year old and I was in my like break. I wasn't really making anything. Yeah. And then I got back to teaching before I got back to art making. Yeah. And I still even, you know, now with a four year old, I don't really get to openings. I don't know a lot of other artists except for teaching artists that I work with who are kind of in the same boat. I feel like we're a little bit disconnected from what I would call the art scene here. Yeah. So I don't really know. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like I was much more involved in the art scene in New York when I was there before having kids. And I was Mm. working at a school, but I would come home and then be able to go out at night and go to openings and all of that. Okay. Yeah. And now I just bedtime is at the same time as any opening. So (laughs) it's not happening. (laughs) So funny how your time just shifts. I mean, we're we're in bed at like nine o'clock, basically 930. We're toast at that point, you know. Yeah, our, uh, our youngest one wakes up at five thirty or six, and it's <sighs> like go time at that moment. You know, yeah. it's like, uh, but yeah, it's funny. At one point, an opening at seven o'clock was like early. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> This is like the yeah. beginning of the evening here, but now it's it's totally changed, you know. And mm-hmm. but it seems like you're you're showing you're showing your work a lot, though. You're active. And- yeah, this year I really started getting it into gear. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. What's the gallery situation like there? Like as far as approaching galleries and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I've really just applied to open calls and gotten a few, yeah. and that's really all that I've done so far. I haven't reached out directly to galleries I feel like I'm not quite there yet Mm -hmm. and I did when you know when things were still open I did try to take my daughter with me not to the openings but if something opened on a Friday night we might go on Saturday and just see the show yeah and there's an interesting thing then because we live you know like a mile from Culver City where there's a huge gallery scene yeah so it's you know right there yeah but there was an interesting thing that would happen when I bring her with me that she's very very memorable. It's like this adorable mm. little four-year-old who's really interested in some of the artwork. Oh, cool. And really critical of some of the artwork. Like there were certain nice. things that she would just be like, what is that? I don't want to see that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then some nice. things that she would just stare at for like 20 minutes. Nice. Art critic. I loved seeing that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but then the I'm kind of a shy person. Like I don't, if I would walk in, I would kind of look at the art and not say a word and then like walk out. Mm -hmm. But with her, I couldn't really do that. She would be talking and asking me questions. And then whoever was working the gallery would want to come talk to us. Sure. So it almost forced me to interact more with (laughs) the galleries. Yeah, definitely. No, it's cool. Yeah. So we'll see when things open up if that continues. But I also do feel like galleries being online has really changed the dynamic a bit for those of us who can't get out to the openings. Yeah. Now everybody's just online and the time that you're able to go, you know, go see the work is whatever time you can. Right. Yeah. It almost feels like it's leveling the playing field a little bit for parents. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that is interesting. It'll be interesting to see how how it changes, yeah, the art the art world mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. But uh yeah, I could see how it would start to be more about the art too and mm-hmm. it'll it'll be interesting for sure. Yeah. 
are there any artists of color that you've shared that you felt were really impactful for your students? Yeah, definitely. I would say I do this project in second grade where we explore texture with paper and Mm -hmm. we look at the work of Mark Bradford. Oh, yeah. Who is really inspirational. He's just such a great artist. And and there's so many like resources, online videos and interviews and stuff that it's really great for the kids to see that. And I just love his process, like how he, Mm -hmm. I just feel like he's constantly just experimenting and playing around and just experimenting with the materials. And yeah, it just, it kind of upends your traditional notion of what an artist does. (laughs) He's got like a kiddie pool uh, in his studio (laughs) and like his soaking papers and, and all this stuff. So, Uh, And like it has these high pressure hoses that he's like hosing down his collages with and stuff. So it's just it's just really interesting. And so the kids are I was kind of blown away by that. And they have so many questions. And so, yeah, yeah, that's that's one. That's a big one that I think is really impactful. And yeah, another one is uh, Stephen Wiltshire. He's a a black artist who lives in Britain. He's also autistic. Mm -hmm. So he'll he'll go, go on these helicopter rides above these big cities and he's able to remember pretty much every detail of the city that you know from wow. from <laughs> from the helicopter ride uh, and he'll go back into the studio later and he'll draw it with meticulous detail every single window that he saw every taxi car uh, like every level of the buildings i mean he, he, it's just incredible and and there's all, all, again like Mark Bradford there's a lot of really inspirational videos online mm-hmm. where it shows him doing this and working in a studio and And he's autistic. So he's, you know, he has challenges with, you know, communicating verbally. And so that kind of brings up uh, some interesting conversations about like, you know, disabilities and stuff. And like, we we kind of, unfortunately, think of disabilities in our society as people that lack something, you know, but you watch this video and these interviews, and you come away thinking, well, this guy has like a superpower, you know, I mean, he's, it's amazing. And uh, so that's pretty cool, too. And just showing the kids his his approach to art making yeah. and yeah that's that's really inspirational the kids are just like floored by how much he can remember and then uh, draw like so realistically what he saw so that's super cool yeah that's amazing now i'm gonna have to go look him up yeah check check him out <laughs> it's it's really cool julie meritu i really mm-hmm. think she's really interesting yeah and nick cave he does those sound suits where yeah yeah he's like using text Styles and different kind of found objects and stuff to make these suits that are really inspiring. Micheline Thomas, so we do like this mm-hmm. big unit on pattern in third grade. She her work has so much pattern in it in really interesting ways. So we look at her work and someone whose work I, I really like Hank Willis Thomas's work. Mm-hmm. He often incorporates basketballs into his work and, mm-hmm. and and there's something about like you know there's so many kids that I teach that are really into sports and sometimes when I'm teaching art I'm like oh yeah we have to like practice this skill first before we do the project. It's kind of like playing sport you gotta practice your uh, free throws and da, da, da. and like the kids yeah. really, those kids that are really into sports like really latch onto that so i try to show his work sometimes because you know sometimes it's it's with kids like they're like okay we go to gym we go to art and they're separate or whatever it's like no okay like you can be interested in all these things and <laughs> right so showing them that yeah it's funny i use that sports analogy with kids too <laughs> oh do you yeah nice <laughs> yeah who else you know like jacob lawrence i think is really good mm-hmm. for showing artwork that like tells a story which i think is really good mm-hmm. like in fourth grade we talk about art that communicates narratives and stories and mm-hmm. jacob lawrence is a really good artist to look at for that yeah and uh Kehinde wiley He's another artist that uh, mm-hmm. we look at in that pattern unit and talk about. Yeah. And, and in fifth grade, too, we, we talk about that when we're doing uh, real, like, representational drawing. We look at his work and stuff. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. Oh, and Chris O'Feely is another artist that oh, yeah. we sometimes look at. There's not, like, a project specifically that we do that's inspired by him, but I, I really like his work and try to, you know, show the kids his work. But, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely – there's so many more artists that I, I could be showing them and, you know, given what's happened, it's tough because I I feel like I do try to show the kids the work of artists of color. But man, I I just feel like we have to do so much more of it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... Yeah. (sighs) Yeah. I've been thinking about how I have worked really hard to make sure that the majority of the artists I'm showing are not white men. Yeah. (laughs) 
But I think for me, it's changing the way I talk about them. Yeah. And maybe even spending more time talking about who they are and why they're making their work, like what's behind the work. Yeah. And what's their story? How did they get where they are? All of that. Right. And always sharing pictures and videos if I have them of the artist. So the kids get to see who they are and get to ideally hear from the artist in their own voice. Yeah. But trying to do more of that as well. Yeah. I think that's really impactful Mm -hmm. when they can see the artists in a video talking and or doing their work in the studio. Yeah. I think that's really, really great. Yeah. When you look at curricula as a whole, it's definitely like white center, like coming from a white perspective. And Mm -hmm. I think the more that we show them these inspirational people of color and these heroes, and, you know, I think that can go a long way. I just think we have to do (laughs) much more of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then how do you work to create an anti-racist environment? Or is there a way you plan to change your curricula to really address racism? Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that I have been grappling with over the past couple Mm -hmm. weeks. It's just trying to figure out how to go about doing that. So, you know, for me, I, I, I know what I needed to do is really learn more about this and and read. And because, you know, like we had, we get like training and Mm -hmm. cultural responsive teaching. And, you know, I remember taking some classes in grad school, but you know, that kind of just scratches the surface. Like, I just feel like given what's happening, it's, man, this has to be ongoing, Mm -hmm. frequent learning about this, about this issue. So I'm going to be dedicating a lot of my reading time, reading books on this issue of race and white privilege and, and, and yeah, trying to figure out how, how I can be more intentional about being an anti-racist in the classroom and, mm-hmm. and how how to try to dismantle that system of white supremacy that is very, mm-hmm. very apparent. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know there's some good books. I've already started getting some. I got Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Mm-hmm. Dive into that one. And but yeah, so I, I look forward to reading, you know, a bunch of books on it and just learning more and talking to people. Yeah. But, you know, I think as teachers, we're in a really good profession to affect change. Yeah. But what I've, one of the strongest messages I've received in the past couple of weeks is like the difference between being someone who's not racist and someone who's an anti-racist, you know, like there's a big difference. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's just not enough to just be like a, a good person and just, you know, <laughs> Like you, you really, yeah, you, you really have to spend a lot of time questioning choices and mm-hmm. being really intentional about it. So yeah, that's something that I'm going to be definitely working on over the summer and definitely continuing throughout my teaching career, you know, so. Yeah, it's a never ending thing, ongoing work. Right, right. Yeah. And thinking of that, like one thing that I've been grappling with also is kind of what we're doing now talking about it, even when it feels uncomfortable. And also doing that in teaching, like letting the kids see you go through that process and letting them see you kind of struggle with it. And then this idea that it's ongoing, there's no end to this. (laughs) Right. It's yeah. just improvement all the time. Yep. And kind of leaning into that discomfort that I feel like it's very easy for us as white people to not think about it. And even those of us who really care and, you know, want to change, the easy thing to do is to talk about it for a week and then be like, okay, moving on anyway, back to life. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because it really, you know, it's easy because it doesn't affect us directly a lot of the time. Yeah, that's kind of I was kind of <sighs> seeing that a little bit on social media, this kind of backlash of these, you know, white people and myself included white people mm-hmm. posting, you know, a black square or like what they want to do and giving voice to showing solidarity and but I know a lot of people of color were were seeing it and they were kind of like in a way like kind of rolling their eyes somewhat and being like all right Mm -hmm. well where were you like you know this is nothing new right (laughs) and also like what are you going to be posting in like a month or two months from now you know and it's true you know it's like uh, it's definitely we got to keep this momentum going and and really yeah but I I do feel like this this moment's a little different Mm -hmm. it just feels different I feel like there are changes that are happening yeah 
here in Minneapolis, that things are changing pretty quick. But yeah, I uh, we just gotta keep the pressure on, you know. And yeah, and I hope that with school and when we're back in the fall, let's definitely keep these conversations going, you know. And mm-hmm. even if they're uncomfortable, like you said, we gotta figure out ways to move forward. So yeah, our district sent out messages verbally in support of Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I feel like pretty good about that. Yeah. And I feel, I feel good that we're going to be moving in the right direction in that regard. I mean, I can't speak for all the districts here in Minnesota. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's so it really starts. I mean, I guess it doesn't start, but it's like school is such a huge part of it. I mean, when you think yeah. of like, you know, like suspension rates and mm. and all that and like how that kind of ties into our subconscious view of punishment and Mm -hmm. the justice system and the criminal justice system and all that stuff and policing. It's just like all kind of tied together in this mess, you know, and it's like, how do we untangle that? And (laughs) yeah, uh, how do you ensure that you're not using the power that you do have as a teacher in negative ways, even unintentionally, like, you know, little microaggressions that Oh, for sure. Yeah, especially growing up not knowing other cultures. It's you know, you really have to educate yourself. And uh. yeah, I just listened to this podcast, the smartest person in the room. Mm, Yeah, this particular one is about education. And this teacher that actually works in LA, Mm -hmm. she was just kind of talking about like, this push, especially in charter schools with predominantly having students of color, Mm -hmm. and how there's this huge push for compliance. Yeah, and like control of behavior. (sighs) She was like, kind of relating that back to like slavery and controlling and like, we got to keep these these kind of people under control. If we don't, it's going to, you know, all hell is going to break loose. Uh, and she made a pretty good argument about it. And it's like you were saying, even teachers who are well-intentioned, you know, and don't think of themselves as having these prejudices or whatever. It's ah, that's like the system that you're working in. And I don't know, it's mm-hmm. it's tough. It's tough to really analyze that. But yeah, when you, when you compare like how we treat behaviors differently and you look at like mm-hmm. private schools with predominantly white populations, it's not about compliance or anything like that. It's about right. freedom of choice and all this stuff. How are we going to, with these charter schools that are all about compliance and, and extreme punishments, like how are we going to teach them how to think outside the box or start up a business later on in life when they're just so, it's just overly regimented and mm-hmm. strict with rules. So Yeah. And then that gets into all the testing also that's so unequal. <laughs> Oh, I know. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I definitely recommend that podcast. It, it was... Yeah, I'll have to check it out. It, it was pretty... I, I never thought about... Like, I, I've spent some time in some charter schools. And, and certainly, it's not all charter schools or anything. But where it's it's definitely... That was the case where it's like so... The kids' hands had to be on the on their lap at all times, otherwise they're gonna get sent out of the room. Or mm-hmm. you know, it was just so extreme. And yeah, yeah, I didn't think about the issues that they were talking about when I was in in the classroom. You know, so mm-hmm. it was good to hear. It was hard to hear, but it was it was good to hear and, and think about that. Yeah, oh, lots more work to do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good that having the conversations, kind of, you know, what mm-hmm. we're doing right now is just, just to have, keep the dialogue open and, you know, especially with well-intentioned mm-hmm. <laughs> white yeah. teachers, you know, like myself. Yeah, I can, so much that I could be learning about and analyzing and stuff. So, yeah, but I, th- I think it's cool, like how with art, we are definitely in a position to affect change. And there's definitely more flexibility in what I can show my kids, Mm -hmm. as opposed to classroom teachers, not that they can't show certain things, but their curriculum is very structured and almost like scripted, you know, and for me, it's like, okay, I got to touch on the standards, but it's pretty open ended as to how I do that. Right. It's great to have that flexibility to be able to really show them these artists and not just show them Vincent Van Gogh and then <laughs> Paul Cezanne. And, you know, I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just not that those artists aren't important, but, you know, it's like, come on, we got to <laughs> yeah. rethink this thing, I think, a little bit. Yeah, I think it is exciting to be in that position to have the ability to structure your own curriculum for the most part. Yeah. And I do see, you know, your first question about who I show, I definitely want to show more of. But when I show them these videos of Mark Bradford working or Stephen Wiltshire, like, you just see these kids that are so inspired and it does make yeah. a difference and it makes sense mm-hmm. uh, when you 
everything in our society is so heavily white, mm-hmm. you know, like every advertisement or most of the shows on TV that it's overwhelming. Yeah. You know, when you really think about it, it's, it's just incredible. So and same thing with school. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that we have like a Black History Month is ridiculous. But having more people that these kids can look up to that are that have the same color skin as they do, or you know, and I also think about that with women artists too. Like mm-hmm. it's so heavily male dominated when you look at art history and showing them more artists that are female is, is really important too. So yeah, so it is rewarding to show them that you're like, hey, check out this artist who like uses a saw like Mark Bradford. <laughs> to like cut away its work and a pressure hose and look at this artist who gets in a helicopter and I, I, it's just it just really yeah it shows them how complex an artist's practice can be or how different it can be than what they think you know yeah definitely What are you curious about right now? Well, definitely, I guess the obvious answer would be just kind (laughs) of how we're going to have to, how things are going to change, like Mm -hmm. with this whole pandemic situation. Yeah. You know, like I worry a little bit about the role of the art teacher in this situation or like, how is that going to, mm-hmm. like I kind of alluded to, you know, we have to be, we have to be promoting our, our programs. And I feel like yeah. in this situation, it's even more, more so because I don't know, I just, I guess I just worry that districts might say, well, we can just find these videos or just have one person take care of the whole district or, you know uh, what I mean? Like just kind of yeah. streamline everything and just kind of like cut costs or, uh, you know, like I just, that kind of bad intentions kind of yeah. <laughs> misguided uh, you know so I, I worry about i worry about that happening because mm-hmm. we're putting we're doing so much video and like and being inspired by so much so many other educators practices and stuff like that and i think that's all good but and then i on the flip side i kind of worry about you know in the future like what might happen with that and i'm just kind of curious uh, like how this is going to change change our our work and our role and i just think we have to be vigilant and, and keep advocating for our programs you know and it's just it's just tough and as far as like the art making thing goes i think kind of what we were talking about mm-hmm. with how do we see each other's work when we can't be close to each other and how do we still stay a part of the art communities that we were a part of or you know still are but like how do we do that you know there's like zoom mm-hmm. and, and the online galleries and stuff i just i just hope those all evolve in positive ways yeah. And I think it will. I just mm-hmm. think so much innovation will be happening, I bet, and things will be constantly changing. But, yeah. you know, of course, like I'm worried about the health repercussions, but, you know, it's like you can't mm-hmm. help but think about your own work and mm-hmm. your livelihood and just like how that will, yeah. how that affect. Because, you know, artists, I don't know what it's like in California, but it's, you know, I just feel like in, as an art educator, like we constantly have to be thinking about, you know, dealing with budget cuts and, mm-hmm. and all that and funding. And it's, yeah it's a tough reality and i just worry about this new era we might put more money into technology and take away money from other things and (sighs) and all that stuff so i I guess i kind of just worry about that a little bit yeah i mean i definitely worried as well and we are always having to really advocate for ourselves individually but our profession as a whole yeah Yeah. And now through all of this, having to advocate that much more. You know, I think the good thing is kind of coming back to that whole like transparency thing too, and just seeing what, Mm -hmm. you know, having the parents see how complex and rigorous Mm -hmm. these projects are. Yeah, I'm just hoping that they see that and will value that too. And because it all, I think it all comes down to parental support, you know? Yeah. And then also seeing what the arts is doing for the kids, but for really for everybody right now that it's Mm -hmm. helping them process emotions and process what's happening and for sure get through this and you know have moments of calm and relaxation have moments of fun and yeah you know yeah definitely and it's interesting how certain kids there's some kids that would kind of struggle in art in the classroom Mm -hmm. and I think part of it was just relationships and Mm -hmm. being distracted and stuff but then seeing the art that they're making at home it's totally different they're like really engaged and (laughs) like like they're able to focus and concentrate in a different way I guess 
and yeah yeah it's just it's just cool and then you're like getting all these messages from kids saying that they missed the art classroom and and all that and it's just cool yeah so yeah you definitely feel valued just hope that continues yeah i hope the people that are higher up that make those decisions are are seeing that you know yes (laughs) absolutely (laughs) yeah oh is there anything else that you would want to share before we kind of wrap up yeah i mean i guess uh so i had this website where i interview i think you you mentioned yes Um, i didn't even ask you about it yeah Yeah. no it's it's all good so it's called ask the art teacher ask the art teacher.com and right i interview Mm -hmm. our educators that i find interesting that are doing really innovative things in the classroom but i just feel like you know kudos to you too i I just feel like the more we can do stuff like this where we're you know talking and sharing ideas and working together as like a larger community and and all that i think is is super important and just really really great so i thrive off of that i I really thrive off of hearing Mm -hmm. other people's stories and because i think like everyone has their their own style their own way of teaching and what inspires them and i think that's what makes art so unique and Mm -hmm. teaching art so unique and different than maybe some other subjects so i just think that community is is very can be very small can be very large and i just feel like the more we do the more we do this kind of stuff and i think like instagram is really great and just kind of seeing what what people are doing and connecting that way and you know i do think there are some not cons i guess but with instagram and how we're sharing so much i think we kind of have to Mm -hmm. you know analyze everything and think is this something i that i you know should be doing or you know because there's a lot of stuff that's out there that's to me more on like the cut and paste kind of cookie cutter Mm -hmm. like crafty side and there's nothing wrong with crafts by any means but you know just being aware of i think it's important that these projects that we're teaching them are you know rigorous and challenging they're Mm -hmm. learning these new things new concepts new techniques learning about diverse artists and and all that so yeah but i think yeah like having having these types of conversations and pushing that needle and advocating for ourselves and i think that's it's all really good so yeah i love your i'll link to it i love looking at your website ask the art teacher and all the different art teachers that you interview and just seeing that diversity of their perspectives and where they come from and how they teach is really interesting and i've loved getting to kind of shine a light on artists and talk more about our own art practice as well as teaching yeah and i think that's important too that you know so many of us you know our kids and parents and even admin other teachers we work with all of those people might never even realize that we have our own art practice as well so getting a chance to really like shine a light on that yeah definitely yeah i think that's awesome yeah that connection is huge yeah but yeah i feel like i grow as a educator like the more i read someone else's story or hear someone else's story or Mm -hmm. connect with them and yeah it's just it's great it's very inspirational yeah absolutely and is there anybody that you would want to thank or give a shout out to you know the teacher that i he's he's a teacher that i interviewed on my on the site craig kane he Uh is a teacher in in new york and so at pratt we did this thing called field work where it's not student teaching i did do student teaching but it was like the first stage of that where you just go into a class and you observe a class for Uh a semester and and help out and stuff but he is just awesome so he was the one that i observed he's an elementary school teacher and he's also an artist and you know shows his work out in new york and has a studio Mm -hmm. and totally does a really good job balancing that he has a family and so he just really just inspired me like reinforced forced that I was making <laughs> the right decision on on becoming a teacher and it was just so fulfilling and just seeing him do these really challenging yeah. projects and ambitious projects like they made a dark room out of cardboard in the classroom and made pinhole cameras and walked around the city and like uh, developed them and, I mean it's just amazing stuff great. you know and did all this like yes. stop motion projects and mm. really cool stuff and just seeing him him work just so inspiring and then also seeing him make his own work at, at the same time and with having a family and it, it's just like just so inspiring so yeah he definitely is one of the most inspirational figures that kind of helped me along my path so yeah I, I would definitely want to thank him for sure yeah awesome yeah and I saw his interview on that on your site maybe I'll link to that yeah. interview too that's really amazing and last thing where can people find you and connect with you online yeah so I'm on Instagram and so I have like a my own personal account, which is just Mark underline Rody R O D E, and that's I have some artwork and stuff that I post in there, but it's just like my own personal <laughs> Instagram. And then yeah. uh, I have my school Instagram.
Instagram account, which shows the projects we work on. And that's art with Mr. Rody. And it's all one word, except for there's a dot in between, a period in between Mr. and Rody. So art with Mr. dot Rody. Uh-huh. Cool. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been really fun getting to know you and getting to hear about your work and teaching and everything else. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Yeah, it's been, it was really fun to be a part of this. And yeah, I think things like platforms like this are great and such a great way to connect with everyone and yeah, foster that sense of community even more. Yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, ah. for sure. Yes. Building community community and advocating for ourselves and our profession is so important. I love what Mark has done to highlight other art teachers with his interview website, Ask the Art Teacher. Go check that out. He has some great interviews with incredible art teachers, including Don Massey, Nick Hahn, Cassie Stevens, Julie Voigt, and many more. I also really like his paintings and how he pushes space and depth using hard lines, opacity, value, color, and texture. I'm excited to see what's next as his practice ebbs and flows. It was nice to talk about the reality of trying to maintain an art practice while teaching and parenting young children. And Mark is still in the thick of it with a four-year-old and eight-month-old. I love his idea of shifting to drawing or watercolor on paper for a while. How has your practice shifted over the years? Send me an email at teachingartistpodcast at gmail.com, tag me or DM me on Instagram at teachingartistpodcast, or send a voice message to that same email and I can share on the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.